Let me invite us to open our Bibles today to the Revelation text, Revelation the 20th chapter, Revelation chapter 20. We'll be looking at the first 10 verses in just a moment. But as we think about the book of the Revelation, some of you are familiar with it and some of you are not. Brother Brett, I'm still too loud. Just a little down. Okay. Revelation, the 20th chapter, the first 10 verses, the millennial reign. When we think about the millennial reign, uh, oftentimes we uh, think of it in a little different sense. There are a multitude of people today, including theologians and uh, those that are Bible scholars that have argued and debated, and some have said it's the most uh, uh, concerning text in all the Bible, some that said it's the most confusing text in all of the Bible. There are a number of theologians, so-called, that say that uh, it is literally uh, mythological and not real. You've got some in the John Calvinist camp that says uh, this has already taken place. In fact, millennial reign has taken place in heaven today, and it's not a real event that shall take place on the earth. In fact, there was Sir Walter Moore uh, wrote a novel in 1516 called Utopia. It was about a society that consisted of total peace, prosperity, and pleasantness without any interference from outside or otherwise. May I remind us, we have a national seeking today uh, on a national level uh, on around the, and around the globe where there is a seeking by the leaders of the nations that are seeking a time of peace. In fact, they are searching for those that can bring about peace, bringing in peace relationships in America and around the globe. That real peace will not take place until the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, rules and reigns for a thousand years. Let me just give you a little overview of the book of the Revelation for those that are not familiar with it. Revelation chapter 1 is the unveiling of the Lord Jesus. Revelation 2 and 3, seeing Jesus in the churches. Revelation 4 and 5, seeing Jesus on the throne. Revelation 6 through 18 is seeing Jesus in the tribulation. Revelation 19 is seeing Jesus in his return. Revelation 20 is seeing Jesus in the millennial reign. Revelation 21 is seeing Jesus in heaven. Revelation 22 is seeing Jesus throughout all of eternity. So the book of the Revelation is chronological and it is about the lovely, lifted, life-giving Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. There are multitudes that say that the book of the Revelation is a myth. There are those that say the book of the Revelation goes forward for a while and extrapolates back, forward for a while and extrapolates back. The book of the Revelation is chronological, and it's going forward at all times. There's a scene in heaven, a scene on earth, scene in heaven, scene on earth, scene in heaven, scene on earth, as it progressively goes through chapter 1 through chapter 22 in the book of the Revelation. May I remind us, as we look at the Revelation text and as we understand what we're looking at in this setting, we're talking about the millennial kingdom, the millennial kingdom. The question begs to be asked and demands to be answered, what is the millennial kingdom, millennial reign? Millennial means a thousand years. It's a thousand years where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on the face of this earth. There's some that say the book of the, the Revelation text in chapter 20 is simply a re recapitulation, a recap of Revelation chapter 19. That is simply not so at all. Uh, there are those that are called the post-millennialists. Brother Marshall's heard of those, the post-millennialists. Uh, they claim that Jesus will reign after a long period of blessing and peace on earth, then Jesus Christ will return. That's called the post, that is the post-millennialists afterwards. Then there are the all-millennialists. You know, you go to a dentist and he says, a doctor and says, open your mouth and say, ah, oh, ah oh, means not really a millennial. The all millennialists claim that the Bible does not teach a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth at all. Then we have the premillennialists. That's us. <laughs> The premillennialists, we believe that Jesus will come back first and then 1,000 years will rule and reign on the face of this old earth. About one-fourth, by the way, of the book of uh, Isaiah is about the millennial reign. About one-fourth of the 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah talk about the millennial reign here on earth. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ will rule and reign a literal 1,000 years, not symbolic, but a literal 1,000 years on earth. And we'll rule and reign with him. You see a little tidbit of that in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 when it talks about Jesus on the throne and we're seated on thrones around him and then we cast our crowns, that is our rewards, before his feet. Can you imagine a thousand years, a thousand years with the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning? There's no pain, no fear, no COVID-19, <laughs> no disease at all. Uh, there's no worry. Uh, there's no uh, concern about a coup 
to have an election to steal the election from the conservatives in America. Uh, there's no uh, plot to overthrow a president in that thousand year rule and reign, where in that uh, 1,000 years it is a perfect world where King Jesus will rule and reign, and the scripture says will rule and reign with him for that 1,000 years. It should cause every Christian today to rejoice in the realization and the recognition of what we have in our relationship to him. The question begs to be asked and demands to be answered. Have you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord? Do you know that you know that you know that you're blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again? In Revelation chapter 20, the first ten verses gives us a little glimpse of what we call the millennial reign. I invite you to stand, please, as we stand together out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, as we read together. The Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must, it's an interesting term, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Um, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that uh, hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, uh, to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compasseth the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and the and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where, a, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever and forever. Thank you. And we may be seated. It is a wonderful text that we need to understand what God is saying in this text. It's a wonderful text, but yet it's one that multitudes have a variety of answers in relationship to what is taking place and what is not taking place. And I want to remind us, it is a literal 1,000 years. There are those who say, well, you know, the Bible says the day is 1,000 years. This is what gets a lot of folks concerned and uh, mixed up on their theology when it comes to the uh, six-day creation, is they talk about great epochs of time rather than being literal 24-hour cycles. But we understand in this text that it's a literal 1,000-year period of time. In this uh, few moments that we have together in the Word, we're going to look at four things that I believe will be informative and beneficial and challenging to us as believers today. We're going to see the restraint of Satan recorded in verses 1, 2, and 3. We'll notice the resurrection of the saints revealed. Thirdly, we'll see the rebellion of sinners reviewed. And fourth, we'll look at the retribution of Satan recited. Notice, if you will, please, in the first three verses, the restraint of Satan recorded. The Bible says in that first verse, and I saw, keep in mind, this is John the Apostle. He's caught up uh, uh, from the Isle of Patmos where he'd been banished for the word of God and for the witness of Jesus Christ. He's caught up to the very portals of glory, and he's been given, a, given by an angel tour, a tour throughout all of eternity, past, present, and future. It is in that text, in the first chapter of the book of the Revelation, that uh, he was told by God to write. It's the little Greek word grapho. If you put it in the young blood vernacular, it means to put uh, uh, print on paper. And that's exactly what he's done. This is the reason we have today reveal for us the book of the Revelation that we see in the text. And John says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key 
of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. I want us to notice, first of all, the Savior's power. We must ask the question, who is this one that John sees? Keep in mind the word angel is the word angelos. It can be a human messenger, divine messenger. It can speak of an angelic being, or it can speak also, as we found several times in the book of the Revelation, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that messenger that's coming down. Who is it that has the power to control uh, Satan? Who is it that has the power and the keys to the bottomless pit? Who is it that controls that? Notice the Savior's power. We, we see, first of all, his power. First of all, we see in verse uh, 1, verse 18 of chapter 1 of Revelation, the Scripture says, Jesus speaking, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. That's talking about death and the grave. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that we see here in this text that has the authority to bind Satan and to cast him into the bottomless pit for the thousand years. Nor the angelic being that you find throughout all of Scripture, nor the individual could you find that would have that power. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself that we see taking place in this scene today. We see he's casting Satan in the bottomless pit. It's the abode of Satan. In fact, Revelation 9, verse 10 and 11 talks about that. Let me read that for us. Revelation chapter 9, verse 10 and 11. And it talks about, And they had tails that were like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt uh, men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath the name Apollyon, both meaning destroyer. And it's talking about Satan himself. It is Satan that is being cast into the bottomless pit. Keep in mind, in society today, in the world in which we're living in today, Satan is the one that's the prince of the power of the air, the Scripture says in Ephesians 2.2. 2. It is Satan that is the one that is the great tempter and the deceiver. It is Satan that is the liar and the father of all lies, the Scripture says. And the only way that we will find that this uh, uh, text can be relevant and real and have 1,000 years of peace and plenty and prosperity, as I call it, for that 1,000 years is to find Satan has been bound. And we find that it's the Lord Jesus Christ that has the power to do so. The living, the resurrected, glorified, exalted Lord Jesus Christ has the power over Satan. Somehow in society, especially among Christians, we feel defeated oft times and feel that somehow, some way, Satan has all the power. Satan has no more power and no more authority than he is allowed to have. He is as a dog on a leash, and that leash will allow him to go only so far. Study the book of Job. In the book of Job, you'll find that uh, there was that table conference, as I call it, where Satan came in and had that table conference, and it was God that mentioned to Job, uh, mentioned to Satan, his servant Job. Have you considered my servant Job? He is a faithful and upright man. He fears God and eschews all evil, the Scripture says. And Satan says, yes, but you let me at him, and he'll curse you to your face and die. Remember the story in Job chapter 1 and 2, and it's not Job, it's Job chapter 1 and 2. <laughs> and in Job 1 and 2, uh, we find that uh, detail very clear. And God says, I tell you what, I'm going to open the door and allow you to get in. You can do whatever you want to, but you cannot take his life. We need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, especially as Christians, that Satan can do not do nothing in our lives, but that God allows it. And if he does, it's for our good and for God's glory. That's easier said than to be uh, uh, beholden to and to embrace and to say, I understand it and rejoice over it. But we need to recognize that Satan will bind, that uh, uh, Jesus Christ will bind Satan, that old serpent, and he will have the privilege and the opportunity, we will, to rule and reign with him for that thousand years. The Lord Jesus Christ will bind him, restrain him with chains. The scripture says there will be no temptation, no tempter. There will be nothing that will be called a satanic movement in the world during the days that the Lord Jesus Christ reigns for a thousand years out of Jerusalem. And may I remind us, and I'll touch on it further in this study today, there has been the promise in the Davidic covenant in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, that there will always, always, always be uh, that one from the line of David that will be seated on the throne, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that 1,000-year reign, it will be the fulfillment of that Davidic covenant for Jesus Christ to rule and reign for that 1,000 years. We see the Savior's power, but I want us to notice also the satanic personality in verses 2 and 3. Notice uh, it is Satan himself. 
life and his personality. It says, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, and bound him a thousand years. Notice his profile, if you will. His profile. Notice the names that's given to the devil. He is called there the dragon, the old serpent, and he is bound for a thousand years, the scripture says. When we look at the scripture, it's a fascinating study, by the way, and I don't recommend that you do it before breakfast. <laughs> But as you study the Scripture and find the names it's given to Satan, he, the personality is pointed out and is found in the names. Abaddon, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, the angel of the bottomless pit, Apollyon, Beelzebub, Belial, deceiver of the whole world, the dragon, the devil, the evil one, the father of lies, God of this world, great dragon, great red dragon, the liar, man murderer, old serpent, power of darkness, the prince of demons, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, the roaring lion, the ruler of darkness of this world, Satan, the serpent, uh, the spirit working in the disobedience, the tempter, the wicked one, etc., etc., that he is called throughout the Scripture. That gives us a good understanding of his personality. And so keep in mind, if he is bound for a thousand years, that old serpent, the destroyer, the liar, the father of all lies, Satan himself, is bound for a thousand years. He is the one that is the accuser of the brethren. He is the one that is the slanderer, the deceiver. And many today laugh at the thought of Satan. Perhaps you've heard some of the so-called theologians that will tell you that Satan is just a myth. He's mythological. Well, if they, you believe that, you've believed a myth. you believe a lie. Satan is real. Satan is relevant. He is the prince of the power of the air today. He is the one that uh, is in the world today to accuse the brethren. He's the one that I believe is in charge in Washington, D.C., in the Beltway today that's making decisions through Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and AOC and the others that's trying to destroy our, our, our constitutional republic. May I remind us, according to the Barnard Report, 58% across denominational lines uh, disbelieve in the reality of that personage, that person called the devil, that old serpent, the devil. He's the one that hinders. He's the one that lies. He's the one that deceives. He's the one that the Scripture says in Second Corinthians eleven fourteen is a masquerader as the angel of light. He's the one that's spoken of in First Peter 5, 8, where it warns, we are to be alert and watchful because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's his goal. That's his modus operandi. That's his purpose and his plan for your life and for mine. We need to be very, very careful in our lives and our living because Satan is there to trip up, to tear down, and destroy anything that God's wanting to do in your life and in my life. Not only do we see his profile, but I want you to notice in that third verse what I call his prison. And cast him, it's the word ballo, means to release and to fling, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. He is shackled, he is bound, he is detained, he is slung into the bottomless pit, according to the scripture. He's shut up, and he's sealed there. If he's shut up, and the seal is there, and it's not, not other than the Lord Jesus Christ that's placing that seal. That is the absolute assurance that he cannot be released. He is there for that thousand years. That shows, again, the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over Satan and all that Satan would want to do in your life or in mine. He is shut up and sealed. That indicates authority. That indicates control. The seal indicates the ownership. Satan can only do what he is allowed to do. And may I remind us, one day he will not be available. He will not be readily out in the world to attempt to, uh, to tempt and to trick and to tear down and to uh, destroy and to accuse the brethren as he is prone to do even today. How long will this be? How long will it last? The Scripture says it will be a thousand years. Notice not only the Savior's power and the satanic personality, but notice what I call the shut-up period. S-H-U-T dash U-P, the shut-up period. The time that he's shut up, the Scripture says he'll be shut up. doesn't mean that God says shut up, but he is literally shutting him up. He is binding him in that bottomless pit. Verse 2 and 3, the Bible says, For one thousand years, and may I remind us again, and it's important for us to understand it. It's a literal 1,000-year period of time. 
It's a literal period of time that is a thousand years till the thousand years should be fulfilled, the Scripture says in verse 3. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. May I remind us again, during that thousand years, there will be peace. There will be plenty. There will be pleasantry that we do not experience today. Satan will be shut up and he will be sealed. And in his sealing, he will be silent and he won't be able to hurt or harm anyone today whatsoever as a result of that. In fact, in Isaiah 2, 4, it talks about in the millennial reign, even the Assyrians and the Jews that are now enemies will live and work together in cooperation. The Scripture tells us that they will beat their plowshares into, beat their swords into plowshares, and there'll be war no more. That's the peace that will be experienced during the days of the millennial reign. It is, as I've called it before in preaching this text, when utopia comes. It will be a utopian society for reality, but it will be orchestrated and carried out by God himself. In fact, in Isaiah the 11th chapter, verses 6 through 9, it talks about the wolves and the lambs and the leopards and the kids and the calves and the lions uh, being in tranquility together. There will be no war and there will be no enmity and there will be only peace during that 1,000 year reign. Isaiah 65 verse 17 through 20, we see the uh, old age uh, will be a thing of the past. won't be anything about getting old, gray-headed, bald-headed, and where you can't see and walk straight <laughs> during that 1,000 year period of time. In fact, there are a lot of folks with a number of questions about the millennial reign and those that will be in the millennial reign. Will we die in the millennial reign? Will there be death in the millennial reign? Will there be marriage in the millennial reign? Will there be sin in the millennial reign? Will there be an opportunity for individuals to make a decision to say yes to Christ in the millennial reign? You see that in the balance of this text. Because we're created as independent, uh, volitional choice beings in the image of God. And that does not change. It is not modified. But during the millennial reign, an individual will live to be a thousand years. Let's say he's born at the entrance of the millennial reign. He'll live to be a thousand years and will produce numbers and numbers in offspring. What about those of the offspring? What about the ones that are born into the millennial reign? Will they simply be born sinless or will they have the sin nature? Let me just simply say this. As best I can understand in studying all of the text in relationship to the millennial reign, they can still disobey, but disobedience will be dealt with immediately on the spot during the days of the millennial reign. But even those that are living during the millennial reign that live because this is what he said you need to do, and they follow that, as you'll see in the latter portion of this unit of thought today, after the uh, Satan is uh, released, there will be those that will still want to follow Satan rather than following the Satan, following the Savior. That is the major, major problem that is almost something that is a consternation in the mind of any human being wondering how that is possible. We understand that there will be no such thing as old age, because a thousand years will be uh, that uh, younger age, as we would call it, in that era. They see the Savior's power, the satanic personality, uh, the shut-up period. But I want you to notice in that third verse the sovereign purpose, the sovereign purpose. Notice that he should deceive the nations no more till, that is, until the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must It's necessary, and it's an important little word there. It is necessary that he be loosed for a little season, that is a short period of time. You recall our study in the 16th chapter of the book of the Revelation, verses 12 and following, where Satan deceived the kings of the world to bring them together for that great uh, uh, battle called the Battle of Armageddon. The 16th chapter of the book of the Revelation, beginning with verse 12, it talks about a deception went out. And that deception that went out was a satanic deception, deceiving even the kings of the earth that came together. Perhaps the deception went out on the basis that it's going to be a G7 meeting, and we're going to talk about peace. Perhaps it was John Kerry in his new role as the the climate czar that uh, sent out the notice that we're going to have we're going to have a conference out of the Paris Accord on how we're going to bring about uh, a, a clean climate on all of the globe by the year 2050, as they're claiming now. I don't know, but the whole point is that that deception goes out, and it is an indication here of the fact that when Satan is tied up, when Satan is bound, when Satan is shut up for a thousand years, that the deception will not be possible. Satan deceives people today uh, to, uh, and may I say that's the best tool that he uses. That's the best tool in his toolbox is that of deception. 
we think somehow, some way today that it's a battle between good and evil, and it is. We think that it's a battle between the Democrats, the Socialist, Marxist, Communist, uh, uh, BLM, Democratic Party today, and the Republican Party. It's not that battle at all. It's a battle between God and Satan. It's a battle between good and evil. It's a battle between our Savior and Satan himself. And it's being played out in the hearts and the lives of humanity on the face of the globe today. We're fighting a demonic battle. But good news, ladies and gentlemen, that battle one day will cease and desist when Satan is bound and shut up and cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. There will be no more battle, no more deception, no more wars or rumors of wars as we find throughout the Scripture because Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will rule and reign for a thousand years. Perhaps you say, where will he rule and reign from? Out of Jerusalem, out of the temple that is not there today. Let me put a little parenthetical footnote on that thought. That temple shall be rebuilt. And may I remind us that it will be, according to the temple movement uh, uh, group in uh, Jerusalem, they have prepared all of the temple garments. They have prepared the temple instruments for worship. And they are waiting and ready with bated breath, with the plans and the specifications, the architectural renderings already having been done. They say that it can be built between 18 uh, months and 24 months can be, the temple can be rebuilt. And it shall be rebuilt. And I think we're on the very verge today of watching the move from Iran and their uh, IRA now. And they're saying they're going to wipe Israel off the map. They've always said that from the uh, Islamic jihadists, and that's what they plan. But I believe there's a high probability that in the near future we'll see a Scud missile get out of control and wipe the Temple Mount clean so that the Temple can be rebuilt. And I pray that as Christians we'll be able to see it even before the rapture of the church. But after the rapture of the church, Jesus Christ will be able to rule and reign after the seven years of tribulation when he returns to rule and reign for that 1,000 years in the millennial reign. May I remind us that there shall be a temple and Jesus Christ will rule and reign from that temple on that temple mount that is there today. Can you imagine a day when Satan cannot deceive? There will be no more lives utterly destroyed by the sodomite lifestyle, no lives destroyed by that which is called the drugs. In fact, I am absolutely astounded that Oregon just passed the laws for all hard drugs to be legal. Fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, all legal. And yet they are concerned somehow, some way, about uh, a lockdown needing to take place to prevent COVID spread in that state. It's an absolute uh, uh, lie being perpetrated by Satan. But that deception of drugs and drinking and the immorality and the chaos that fa is found today, the broken homes, the broken lives, the broken marriages, Satan always lies. But there's coming a day that that will not be any longer because he will be cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. We see the restraint of Satan recorded. We see, secondly, in verses 4 through 6, the resurrection of the saints revealed. The resurrection of the saints revealed. Notice the saints' coronation in verses 4 and 5. And John is speaking, and I saw thrones, that's thronoses, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, Neither his image, neither had, their, uh, had they received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and re reigned with Christ a thousand years. Listen, it's very important for us to understand and recognize the place and the setting and what is happening here in this text. The scripture talks about the saints' coronation. We see, first of all, the saints' room. There will be the thrones and they will be not be occupied by angels. They'll be occupied by the saints of God. Listen very carefully for, to the chronology. The next thing on the calendar of God, and there are no other signs that ought to be fulfilled, needs to be fulfilled biblically before the rapture of the church. The next thing on God's prophetic eschatological calendar is the rapture of the church. Immediately after the rapture of the church, the man of sin, the Antichrist, steps on the scene along with his sidekick, the false prophet. They're able to work signs, miracles, and wonders, and you'll not be able to buy, sell, trade, open your business, or not wear a mask unless you have the mark in your forehead or on your 
ahead uh, during that time. During that uh, period of time, the Antichrist will rule and reign. After the seven years, the Lord Jesus Christ will split the eastern sky as he returns in absolute grandeur and glory. And the Bible says in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, that we'll return with him. And Re uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following, talks about the fact that he will bring, come back with all of his holy angels. And in Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16, we will be with him. We will come in victory and grand glory. And every eye shall see him, the Bible says. And after that, there will be the judgment seat of Christ, where every Christian will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and be adjudicated based on what we've done in the body, whether it be good or bad. The word evil is their ponderos, bad, worthless. And then we will be seated around the table with the Lord Jesus Christ in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will return with Him, the Bible says. And may I remind us, as we see here, the saints are going to rule during that period of time. The Scripture says in Hebrews 2, 5, For unto the angels hath He not put in the subjection to the world to come? And the Bible says that there will be thrones and dominions. And the Bible also reminds us that the saints in 1 Corinthians 6, and verse 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know not that ye, they shall judge angels? Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that during the days of the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will rule and reign with Him. We will judge the world with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will judge the angels along with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the saints rule. We see the saints' coronation, and we rule with the Lord Jesus Christ and reign for that thousand years. The saints' resurrection is found here. All of the saints, some have argued, and I've read behind some of the so-called scholars on the subject. And they're in great consternation of who these saints will be. There's a great consternation as to uh, who, which saints uh, will be there. It is the saints of God. And may, may I remind us, we have already been resurrected in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, the classic text for the resurrection, the classic text uh, for the rapture of the church. We will already be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be in heaven with Him and we will return with Him. We will rule and reign with Him. And it will be all of the uh, uh, saints that were martyred for their faith during the days of the tribulation. We will be ruling and reigning with Him. It will be those that have been condemned and castigated and uh, put to death here on earth. Those that uh, now will be crowned and coronated when utopia comes, when the new millennial takes place. We will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only the church age saints, but all of the tribulation saints. The scripture says in verse 4, the latter portion, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither the image, neither had uh, received his mark upon their foreheads or in their heads. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You recall in the sixth chapter of the Revelation text, where there's a cry from under the altar of God. How long, how long before our blood will be vindicated? And they are told by the Lord Jesus Christ, just a little longer. There's still some more that will be martyred for their faith. There are yet others that their lives will be taken as a result of the witness of God and the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are those that are crying out. And these are those that will be ruling and reigning with the church age saints. The tribulation age saints will also be there. And we will be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. The tribulation saints that have been slain because of their steadfastness, their steadfastness in the witness for Jesus, their steadfastness for the Word of God. Those who refuse to be identified with the 666, if you will, of the Antichrist. In fact, in the 14th chapter, if I can turn to it very quickly, in the 14th chapter, verse 9 and following, I'll read a few verses. And the third angel following them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast or the image and receive his mark, and the forehead in their head, hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of the judgment, uh, in the cup of indignation. And uh, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of Christ, etc., etc., etc. Those during the days of the tribulation will have that opportunity to say, continue to say yes to Jesus Christ and obey, obey him, or because they want food, clothing, and shelter more than they want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, will accept the mark. And the scripture 
very clear if they've accepted the mark, if they've been uh, willing to bow before the satanic, demonic ruler, the Antichrist of that day, they will not be in heaven. They will not be a part of those that will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in that thousand year rule and reign in the uh, millennial reign with Jesus Christ. May it remind us, John was banished to Patmos because of his witness and because of the word of God, according to Revelation 1.9. According to Revelation 12 and 11, the Bible says, And they overcame him, that is Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, that's Calvary, and by the word of their testimony, that's confession, and they love not their lives unto death, that's commitment. And those that have loved the Lord Jesus Christ and have absolutely confessed Christ as Savior and they have made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be with Jesus in that thousand year reign. The scripture says in the latter portion of verse 4, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And again, I remind us it's a literal thousand year period of time. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead, that is all of the lost, that lived not un again until the thousand years were finished, this is the first resurrection. And now to clarify that in the minds and the hearts of some that are confused about it and some that I've read behind that talk about it, well, wasn't the first resurrection in the rapture of the church? The rapture of the church is a resurrection, no question about it. But in the context of these verses, in the context of this unit of thought, chapter 20, verses 1 through 15, verses 1 through 10 is the portion we're looking at today, this this is the first resurrection of that group that is spoken of here. May I remind us, there are five resurrections in the Scripture. Let me just briefly recap those for our understanding so that it give a little clarification. First of all is the resurrection of Jesus. That begins the resurrections according to First. Uh, Corinthians 15, 23. Then the resurrection of the church age saints. That's the rapture of the church. First Thessalonians, uh, we find verses 4 through 18. Third, the resurrection of the tribulation saints. That's in Revelation 20, verse 3 through 5 here. Together with the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Isaiah 26, 19. And then the resurrection of the lost dead. And that's in verses uh, 11 through 15 in this same unit of thought in chapter 20. It is after the resurrection of the lost dead that we see the great white throne judgment, which is the next thing on the calendar of God in the chronological events in the book of the Revelation. Not only do we see the saints' coronation, but I want us to understand the saints' celebration in the sixth verse. Notice the scripture says, Blessed and holy is he that is in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is the saint's celebration. Blessed and happy, holy. I made a little marginal note, the Bible does not tell us what we will be doing. That's one of the main questions it seemingly uh, asked. In fact, I did a little research even online to see what the online heresy would be. It's always interesting to me to see what others say in that vein, in that particular venue. But there was the major, major consternation. The greatest question asked, as I could read online, was what will we be doing in the millennial reign? I don't know, and I don't care. And I know we'll be with Jesus, and that's enough for me. <laughs> the Bible does not give any major overview other than the fact we'll judge the earth and we will judge the angels. That's part of our responsibility. But we'll have the joy on, uh, on ending for that thousand year reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be joy unspeakable that we'll be blessed and holy, the scripture says, serving Him and ruling and reigning with Him. May I remind us we have we will take part in that rule and reign with Jesus and we'll rejoice evermore. Someone said, and may I quote, there's little genuine happiness among men today because there's so little holiness among men in the world today. But there will be only happiness and holiness and joy unspeakable for the child of God in our celebration with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we see the saints' coronation and the saints' celebration, but notice the saints' confidence in that uh, sixth verse in the latter portion. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The question begs to be asked, and I've said it over and over and over down through the uh, past uh, year approximately in going through the book of the Revelation. The question is, are you saved? Do you know that you're saved? If you're born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you're going to die once. It's an old cliche, but it's very real. 
The question must be asked, have you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior? Listen, John Calvin was absolutely deceitful, if I can be very kind for John Calvin. There's no such thing as being uh, predestinated unto salvation and unto heaven and predestination unto hell. It's an impossibility. We're created volitional beings. We make a volitional choice. We say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And the question is, have you made the volitional choice? Have you said yes to Christ as Savior? Do you know that you know that you know you're blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again? When everything is said and done, that's all that counts in eternity is our relationship to Jesus Christ. There's a personal volitional choice that's needed. The believer will forever be beyond the reach of the second death, the Scripture is telling us here. We'll be exalted with the Lord Jesus. We'll be entrusted with ruling and reigning with Him. We'll be enthroned with Him for a thousand years. I don't know about you, but it makes me a little anxious for that moment. To be with the Lord Jesus. It should cause every child of God to look forward to with anticipation and hope as nothing in the world can offer today. Notice in verses 7 through 9, the rebellion of sinners reviewed. Now I want to tell you, I'll admit to you, this is the caused me the greatest consternation of any portion of this text. I must ask the question, how is it possible to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years? How is it possible for folks to be born and live for a thousand years and see pleasantry and plenty and prosperity and peace as the world has never known and then turn your back on Jesus Christ? How is that possible? Consternation upon consternation, I must admit, is mine. In analyzing this text, would you think that after a thousand years of peace and plentiness that man's heart would be still so staunch and so cold? Would you think that somehow, some way, man would still reject Jesus Christ? In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that sets the pace. At the start of the millennial, all are saved, but there are no deaths, and millions will be born during that period of time, and they never get saved. They only follow the rules, if you please, and follow the regulations of what is required for them in that era. Millions today are gospel-hardened. Millions today will hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their hearts become callous and cold and hardened and reject Christ. I want us to notice in that seventh verse the satanic delight, the satanic delight. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Satan will be loosed out of his prison. May I remind us as we see that, we understand that the only way he is loosed is by Jesus Christ himself releasing him. Why is this done is the great question that begs to be asked, demands to be answered. Why is Satan loosed? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ release him after he's been bound for a thousand years? What is the purpose? What is the mandate that Jesus Christ has? What is the reason and the rationale behind it? It is so that man can exercise his volitional choice. Man was born a volitional being. Look at Adam and Eve. God said, don't. They said, we will. They disobeyed God. That's volitional choice. The sovereignty of God is real, but the free will of man is also real. And yet we have those denying the free will of man and saying it's all sovereign God that does it all. The reason that he is released is to prove and to show that uh, there are those that are true believers, those that have said yes to Christ, that it's real in their hearts, that we are not puppets that we can choose and make a decision. It is a volitional decision. Not only do we see the satanic delight, but notice the satanic deception in verse 8. Speaking of Satan being released, and shall go out to deceive, that is to trick, that is to lie to, that is to fool, the nations which are in the four corners of the world, that is of the earth, Gog and Magog, that is the symbolic of all nations against God, together to gather them together to do battle. Listen to what the scripture is saying. It is the satanic deception. 
Satan still wants to defeat the Lord Jesus. Satan has always had one purpose and one plan, and that is to emulate, to replicate, to duplicate all that God has done. Satan wants to be worshipped. This is the reason he was uh, Lucifer kicked out of heaven. It's because he exercised his prideful will. I will, I will, I will, I will. Five times he said, I will be like God. I will be worshipped as God. And may I remind us there's coming a day in Revelation chapter 12 during the days of the tribulation that Satan will be kicked out of the heavenlies. He's kicked out of the heavens into the heavenlies. He'll be kicked out of the heavenlies and will be literally Satan incarnate walking upon this earth to deceive and destroy mankind in those last days of the tribulation. And we understand in this text that when Satan is released, he will still go to and fro in the earth after the thousand year reign of Christ and will deceive mega millions into following him. Satanic deception. May I say to us today, the man of sin, the Antichrist, operating under the power of Satan, we will see the satanic demonic empowerment being carried out even then after the millennial reign. Satan still is out to destroy Satan's logistics are simply to destroy and to tear down. They're those that will tell us that a person's environment is what causes them to be what they are. That's out of the Green New Deal, I reckon, because it's not real biblically or otherwise. AOC says you give everybody everything. If you provide free education, free medicine, and open borders, and anyone can come and go without having to have the proper documentation or being a citizen, that everything will be fine. Utopia will be absolutely reached by doing so. Listen, utopian mindset coming out of the millennial reign, there's still those by the millions that will follow and be deceived by Satan himself. The environment that we live in has nothing to do with the heart. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can change the heart. Nothing more and nothing less. The scripture says here, The numbers of whom is as, notice the simile, as the sand of the sea. How many is that? Totally innumerable. Cannot count them. Millions will follow Satan and believe the satanic demonic lie. Because just like today, he has uh, the mindset and the modus operandi of deceiving to destroy humanity. He feels... Man feels today that he doesn't need God. Man feels today that he's self-sufficient. He can make it on his own. But I want us to recognize that without God, it's an impossibility. And in that day, after the thousand-year reign, Satan is released. There will be the absolute mega millions that will follow Satan. Notice in the ninth verse, not on the satanic delight and the satanic deception, but notice the sudden destruction. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, talking about Jerusalem, and fire came down from God. It wasn't because of climate change. Fire came down from God out of the heaven and devoured them. Now listen, there's not anything that I have read that couples it. But when you study Second Peter, you find the earth being destroyed by fire. It is my most humble opinion that we see the match being struck here, if you will that brings about the ultimate destruction of the earth through fire that shall take place and cleanse this whole world. But notice the Bible says, they encamped about, that is Satan and all of his followers, encamped about, that is encircled Jerusalem, the holy city. It is the uh, intended purpose to wipe out and destroy those that reject anything that is called uh, uh, the uh, Satan and a satanic demonic being and those that receive the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in and trust in and follow him. But may I say to us, the immediate judgment is awaiting. Almost like, and I've compared it with the Annie and Safi, Ananias and Sapphira, the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, uh, they told a line. Peter says, why, why is Satan putting your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And immediately they had a holy heart attack. If the holy heart attacks were to take place today, we would thin humanity and Bill Gates wouldn't have to get involved with his vaccinations at all. But we find Satan and all of those mega millions following him. There's no army, no battle. God simply consumes them with the fire called down from heaven. No funeral, no cemetery, no hospital, no COVID-19 declaration, no doctor, no crematory, 
They're just wiped out completely. Zod, psh, gone because of following Satan. Listen as this final verse is looked at. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. Listen to what is taking place. Notice the retribution of Satan recited. Satan is doomed for all of eternity. One day he'll be totally destroyed. Notice the sure destination. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. It's Tartarus. It's the place called hell. And yet there are multitudes today that deny and reject. Get all, as I call it, bowed up in the back and say hell is not real. In fact, the Pope said March of this year that hell is not a real place. Uh, Rob Bell that wrote the book Love Wins said that hell is just the last stop before we get to heaven. And I could go on and on and on with the great thinkers of today and their rebellion and rejection of that place called hell. God says it's real. And you look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 17 through 21, the false prophet and the Antichrist have already been cast into hell. And here the one that empowered them, Satan himself, is cast into that place that is called hell. Not only do we see the sure de, uh, dis, uh, destination, but the severe doom. And shall be tormented day and night. That is literally in the continuing voice forever and forever and forever and forever. Man makes a choice to go to hell. He doesn't go there because uh, it is something that is caused by an outside force. Man, humanity, makes a choice to go to heaven or to go to hell. In fact, it is in Second Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, God is long is uh, uh, long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God wants you to get saved, saved, saved. And we're not saved by osmosis. We're not saved by being a good person. We're not saved by being a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, confused, or anything else. We're saved by volitional choice to say yes to Christ as Savior and as Lord. God wants us to say yes to Him. No annihilation. The beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet have been there now for a thousand years and Satan is cast into that place called hell. That is a place of loneliness. That's a place of darkness. That's a place of damnation. That's a place of eternal destruction and doom. That's a place that is very real. I happen to know the author of the book, Please Don't Go to Hell. I commend the book highly. It outlines biblically everything that's found in the Scripture about that place called hell. And the Bible says that Satan one day will be cast into hell. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation hymn, an opportunity for you to say yes to Christ, an opportunity for you to make a decision that God would have you to make today, whatever it may be. But before we have everyone standing and before the pianist plays, I want to ask you a question. Can you reflect back in your mind a date, a time, a place when you said yes to Christ? If you say, I think I'm saved, that won't work. If you say, I hope I'm saved, that won't work. If you say, I believe I'm saved, what is it based upon? We need to know that we're saved. And the only way we can know that for sure is to know that we personally, volitionally made the decision, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Help me to live for you because you died for me. That's biblical salvation, nothing more, nothing less. It's not complicated.